Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to today's uh, AI for your lab talk. And today we have the pleasure to welcome Muhammad, uh, who was uh, uh, our former colleagues and are now coming back again. Uh, nevertheless, I want to give a rather formal <laughs> intro to Muhammad. So uh, he studied uh, electric engineering at the University, at National University of Science and Technology in Pakistan. And then he came to Germany and hold a, a master's degree in autonomous system for the Bonn Rhein Siege University of Applied Science. And uh, then um, he started uh, his PhD with us, um, doing basically object reconstruction from 3D INSA point codes, who I think is the first one in the community doing something similar. And uh, afterwards, uh, he immediately went back to uh, the university where he did the bachelor and become an assistant uh, professor there. And uh, yeah, so uh, there, I, I think he has also quite some important functions like the co-director of the mach uh, machine region and the learning lab and also um, uh, co-director of the deep learning lab um, at the National Center um, of artificial intelligence. And um, besides NUST, he also has quite some, um, had some research experience uh, in different uh, um, institutions, um, um, including Tugats, where he also did uh, um, stay in abroad during his uh, PhD study. And also he was uh, in Fraunhofer Institute um, during his um, master study. And uh, as Diana already mentioned, uh, starting from this year, uh, he comes back again to us uh, as a guest professor in the future lab and uh, mainly focused on the topic which is related to the quantification of uncertainty. So um, Mohammed, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arshan, for my for my great introduction. <laughs> so uh, the work which I am going to uh, present today is uh, actually based on the varying topics uh, which I have been working with my colleagues in the last two three years, and it was actually quite difficult to make the work coherent. But somehow I managed to do it. So let's see how it is. So the work would be centered around the segmentation and detection, but with different applications. So uh, primarily, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the segmentation and the detection problem, and along with the applications in the varying, uh, the varying fields with different kinds of data as input. And in segmentation, I'm particularly going to talk about the radar image segmentation and 3D point cloud segmentation. I'll, I'll explain two different kinds of methods to, to do the segmentation in 3D point clouds. And in detection, I would rather more focus on um, three major applications uh, during this uh, vehicle re-identification, image captioning, and feature point detection. So uh, these, these will, will be the applications which I will be focusing on. So bear with me. So let's, to begin with, let's talk about uh, radar image segmentation. So uh, we all know that the deep learning methods, for example, the CNNs have actually become the de facto standard for numerous computer vision applications. And although it is also consistently increasing in data, uh, but still the use of SAR images is, is limited. And the primarily uh, the major bottleneck in this is actually the availability of annotated SAR data sets, especially for the urban environment. So it's quite difficult to have like uh, do the data annotation and uh, having the more, having the same data and uh, use that for machine learning. So I mean, it's very important, but it is, it is a scale of bottleneck. So the options we have to obtain such SAR annotations its first option is like we could do this manual or the somewhat interactive annotation. Like this is one potential solution, but of course it requires an expert knowledge and easily becomes impractical when a large team needs to be labeled. And other option which could be employed for people familiar with SAR is uh, like if we could employ the SAR simulation based uh, models. And, uh, uh, but however, they, they also have like the limitations in a sense that they also require accurate 3D building models or accurate DSM digital surface models uh, to precisely generate such ground source data, which in most cases is, is, is usually not available. And there is also a third option, uh, which is uh, use of existing geographic information systems data to obtain direct annotations in SAR images. So this, this, this seems like, uh, I mean, 
at least from hearing point of view, it seems a viable approach. But there is a problem that we can't we can't directly use this GIS data to uh, annotate SAR images, and the problem is because of different geometry of SAR images. And to illustrate this, I show you an example. So uh, this is the top scene of a 3D a 3D region. Like these are the three buildings, and we are well, this is the top view. So if I just show you how the SAR images are formed, so if if the platform carrying the radar sensor is flying in this direction, and the look direction is like this slanted downwards, then this is the kind of radar image which gets formed. So here, uh, the major issue is, for example, if you see like the point in this on the building top and the point lying on the on the on the ground, they basically basically tend to have the same distance from the sensor and eventually merge into a single pixel into this into the star image uh, like this. So of course now if we have the have, we have the uh, 2D polygon from the GIS data and if we want to project them back onto the SAR image, so this is what we get. So of course I mean they do provide us some kind of prior knowledge, but we cannot directly use them uh, to paint the SAR annotations itself. So and this this is because this phenomena is by where we have like these two pixels merged into single pixel is called layover, and so this is like a geometric illustration of that. And in this, in this, you can see like these are the like three discrete points, of this, and where basically they all get have the same distance to the radar, and they get merged into a single uh, into a single thing. So just very briefly, uh, there is a technique called SAR tomography, uh, which aims at uh, separating these scatters within one azimuth range pixel by exploiting stack of star images. They are taken from slightly different positions, uh, like this as it as it So. If I, uh, I mean, the, any any complex pixel and any end acquisition action in this R image can be approximated by this integral of the reflectivity function gamma. And since it is well known that the uh, far field direction X, like a Fourier transform, this integral is actually uh, nothing but irregular Fourier transform sampled at these discrete frequencies. And actually, uh, this uh, uh, continuous model can actually be discretized in the elevation domain. Like this, we could actually realize by replacing this integral with a summation like this, and this this represents a single pixel measurement. So, if we want to stack all the measurements in a particular stack pertaining to one single perfect pixel, we could actually put them all on into a single matrix like this, and we could all like all these uh, uh, Fourier exponentials into a single matrix R and the unknown reflectivity vector into gamma. Then basically, what Tomosar does is, is Tomosar aims to invert this imaging model to retrieve the unknown discretized reflectivity vector, which is like this. So this is this is what uh, Tomosar wants to invert. And once we have like these discretized uh, positions, we could actually end up into a 3D reflectivity distribution in the star imaging domain, and which we could actually geocode in real world coordinates to obtain this kind of 3D point cloud. So the we have referred to as Tomosar point cloud because we constructed by a star tomography. And this, like this, is the glimpse of a Thomas R. Point cloud of of Berlin. And how can we? Uh, uh, why I'm talk? Why I'm talking about this? Because uh, I use an idea where we do uh, segmentation on in these point clouds and extract out the building, and then use this to generate SAR annotation maps. And for this, what I did was I used like OpenStreetMap data. This is like the OpenStreetMap of Berlin. Like, and these are the 2D polygons of the of the building outline. And in, they're presented in the shape file. And what we, what we do is I use this this information and, the, and this point cloud information and, and fuse them together to extract all those points, almost the points that lie within the build, or at the building point or building points, or basically to extract out the building points. Or we could actually do an I mean a separate. Uh, we can also apply a separate uh, you know way to extract out the building points. Or we or we could use some some kind of GIS data to extract out those points. And once we have the building points extracted out, these building points are then we can we could actually project them back to the SAR imaging coordinates to yield the building mask. And after after some uh, image processing, we could actually end up in a in a very nice visualized uh, annotation maps, which could we could use to train deep learning models. So just show you the result how how it works. So for example, here this is like the uh, SAR image of a Berlin, and when we like extract out the uh, Tomosar points. And project them back onto the SAR imagery and do some image processing. So these are the annotations which we get. So you see, I mean, this is like a, on, a, on, a, on a global scale, uh, we could we could actually get these kind of annotations, and uh, we could actually use them uh, to train uh, use as a master as a ground truth value uh, to train the deep learning models. 
Of course, we uh, there uh, there are some issues. For example, because uh, we use the open street map data in, in this project, and it, it, it's a crowdsourcing project. So there were some missing buildings which we figured out later. For example, here, I mean, this building is missing, this building is missing, so there were no polygons in the OSM data. And when we, of course, project then, and then, of course, there is no uh, no information related to these buildings there. And also, um, we also noticed that there were also some false annotations in the OSM data because it's, of, of course, it's a crowdsourcing project. For example, this, this railway line is like falsely annotated as, as a building. And basically, these this also comes into the into the annotation part. But nevertheless, this I mean, uh, we could actually use this. So we thought we we need to quantify this. So what we did is we we took some region and actually hand labeled and manually annot and annotated the whole SAR image and did some evaluations. And we found out that with the OSM data, we are able to produce like some, some these quantitative numbers, like around eighty percent of the uh, of the uh, uh, like around eighty percent accuracy. So later, the next step, what we did was we actually used that to uh, to like we uh, to train a deep learning model. So in this, we basically divided this whole region into 16 patches where we use five for testing, like these five and 11 patches for for training. And what we trained a fully convolutional neural network, um, CRS and RNN, uh, to train an end-to-end -end, uh, trainable network like this. I mean, the architecture is quite, quite familiar, uh, but uh, and uh, we use this to train and predict uh, the building the building pixels basically. So uh, if I show you the results of, of this, so this is something what we what we get. So we, all these green points are basically the correct building points, and then the rest are basically the, you know. So basically, it's, it's binary uh, segmentation task which we perform here uh, in, in, into this arm. And of course, the good thing is that we would actually have like uh, because we have the global data. So potentially, I mean, we could generate such kind of maps for in a, uh, like on a large scale. So, and these are these, these are some of, some of the accuracies, which uh, so roughly we got around 80, 85 percent or 83 percent accuracy in, in doing this uh, building segmentation task in the radar images. So I showed you one particular example where we could actually use 3D segmentation task, and that, for example, here it's I showed you that 3D segmentation, or if we extract out the building points in Tomosa points, we could use them to create large scale annotation masks. So, what else it could be useful for? So, I'll, I'll show you two use cases, two examples uh, over which I also which work, and they are both related to 3D point, uh, 3D object reconstruction, one in the urban environment and one in the vegetation environment. So, for example, we could, uh, if we have like this uh, kind of a, a point cloud, but Tomosa point cloud, and this basically represents these are these are the points collected over the Biladi Hotel and US. And what, if we perform the segmentation task, we could actually extract out all these building points. So this would be the building point would be segmented out, and then we could actually go further to perform instance segmentation. Instance segmentation would refer to as like two buildings. But but the two buildings are different, so we basically would color them in a different manner like this. And then we could extend this to part segmentation, where we could actually uh, uh, assign each point belonging to an individual part of the building, and then we could actually do some model fitting to uh, fit a, a model into each of the of these expected points to generate some kind of 3D building model, which is something like this. So, so we could do this on a on a larger scale. And also, since we uh, since uh, it, it's a radar point cloud, and we also use the radar data to generate these kind of point clouds, so we could also texturize the 3D point cloud uh, with the deformation estimates, which we could ex which we could infer using the uh, SAR interference. So, like if we end up into this four-dimensional uh, building models, which we end up. So this was like this is an urban environment scenario. So then we also like, had some uh, something which in in a, in a vegetation scenario. A way we did utilize this point cloud segmentation uh, to build individual 3D constructions. So here, for example, uh, we could also acquire point cloud over this uh, smaller region. Uh, uh, this this region is, by the way, in Munich. So this is around 300 by 300 uh, meters. And so they, if we have, we can, if we generate this kind of point cloud, we could also do this uh, the point cloud segmentation like this. And we could end up like for each point which belongs to an individual tree, we could actually do some model fitting. And this model fitting to generate that three, uh, this kind of uh, individual 3D constructions, where basically each 
to 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 this this basically you give us the structural parameters of individual trees, uh, which is helpful for trees to monitor how they are growing and other stuff. So this is what I uh, uh, this, I mean this is how I talked about I mean why they are useful. So uh, how we can we could do this uh, point cloud segmentation. So there are um, the conventional approach which I refer to is basically uh, traditionally before the advent of deep learning. So what people were doing is they were using extracting the handcrafted features and then using them to in a supervised and unsupervised uh, model uh, uh, training. So for if we want to extract out these handcrafted features, the first thing uh, what people need to do is uh, basically define a neighborhood relationship. So uh, you could either use a KNN graph or you could actually define a, 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 a you could actually fit a cylinder like this, or you could make a spherical neighborhood, whatever whatever fits to your application, you could do this. For example, here I'm using showing you this uh, cylinder neighborhood, which for example, this red point is a point of interest, and all these two, two points are the neighbors of this, of this red point, and, and the rest is are basically not, not the neighbors of this point. And we could use uh, this basically to and one particular uh, feature which we extensively uh, we essentially use was this point density estimate because this we have the radar image, and it's a side looking geometry, so we tend to have many points on the on the building uh, to, to extract out the uh, building points like this side this kind of point density to really help us in extracting out the building uh, building points. So this is one particular feature which could be useful. What else could be useful is, for example, which many people use is like they kind of use uh, this 3D uh, because this 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 uh, as in the local neighborhood represents an underlying 3D structure. So what we will does is we compute the covariance matrix of this neighborhood relationship and compute the eigenvalues of this, or basically do the eigenvalue analysis. So these are like lambda one, lambda two, lambda three denotes this uh, the eigenvalues of this covariance matrix of, of this neighborhood relationship. And we could actually use them to extract many important features pertaining to an individual point. So for example, I mean if the, uh, if like we if I show you in two dimensions, so if we have like this is the uh, uh, the covariance matrix ellipsoid which fits around these points, that we could extract out the major dimensions using the eigenvector analysis. And here, where this eigenvector denoting to the smallest eigenvalue, which actually, which actually represents in the normal direction. So we could actually compute a normal direction of every point using this local neighborhood. Or what we could do else is we could measure the abstract ratio, or it is a measure of flatness. So, for example, if we have an anisotropic like kind of structure. So here we we tend to have like this, this kind of ratio is small for this kind of anisotropic uh, surfaces, and for spherical surfaces, for example, like the, where the distribution is more spherical, we tend to get like these 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 ratios quite hard. And there are quite a lot bunch of uh, features which people have actually used with the eigenvalues, for example, this omnivariance, eigenentropy, linearity, planarity, and the uh, change of curvature, and many others. And and then then basically use these these kind of features and to in uh, and use this, any unsupervised or supervised model to train based on these features. So basically, I mean, what people mostly did was they use like either region growing approaches, where we, we tend to have like this is like a DD scan or or or, or a constraint surface normal based region growing where you just put you define a neighborhood and then uh, all the points within the neighborhood you kind of merge them and grows the region. So this is like one uh, unsupervised way of uh, doing this segmentation. The other one, other one is a Gaussian sphere plus mean shift clustering. So here the idea is that, for example, the if there are three, three surfaces, so if we extract out the normals of every point on this surface, extract normals of every point on this surface, extract normals of and this surface, and if we transform them into a unit sphere, so this like all these points on the sine surface have a, would be have normal somewhere cluster down in this region, and for this blue would have clustered in, in this region, and and green would be have like this. So we could actually do an unsurprised clustering in this uh, Gaussian sphere and then uh, 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 go back to the uh, to the spatial domain to obtain this uh, clustering part. And uh, similarly, uh, also people adopted like energy minimization frameworks uh, where we tend to formulate the, this energy in this two into, 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 into like this a formulation where we have a like data cost term and a smoothness term and uh, usually this energy is minimized using graph fit and uh, to, to obtain the labeling of all of all the points. So this is like more of the conventional. What about the deep learning uh, based uh, point? Uh, what about the deep learning based? What about deep learning based point cloud segmentation? So of course, uh, if we, if I talk about uh, uh, deep learning, and in 2017 the first seminal paper actually came, which uh, which really did deep learning on and structured point clouds. Before that, it was not I mean uh, not shown 
how to uh, to extract features from the fine clouds primarily because the fine clouds are unstructured. By unstructured, I mean there is no there is a lack of grid structure. For example, in 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 in, in images we have a regular structure around the pixels. We know the neighborhood relationship. But in 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 point cloud, the the structure is unordered, which basically also like uh, uh, it's also the case because with uh, it's also it's also problematic because we need to have the models uh, having the permutation invariant so that we can feed in any order and still get the same results. And also like we can we want we want to have arbitrary number of uh, of neighbors. We don't want to have a fixed number of neighbors. So any any neighbor uh, number of neighbors could, should vary. And this was hard to model, like, like how to do deep learning like on 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 this kind of problem. So there was also like other problems, like the, the point I was asked to have sometimes they are sparse and sometimes they have variable density and like other uh, equation artifacts, occlusion and data volume and stable. So these are some problems uh, which actually limited earlier uh, application of deep learning on the 3D point clouds. So one potential idea um, initially, what people thought of was uh, was the was, was the voxelization voxelization step. So the idea was to generalize the 2D convolutions to, uh, which extract, uh, to extract the feature points to regular 3D kit. And like we could actually voxelize this. Voxelize means that we kind of made a 3D cube, uh, completely uh, divide the whole the points out in, into this 3D cube and then uh, apply 3D convolutions over this to extract out the uh, features of the individual point. So of course this, uh, uh, this works, uh, but of course what the drawback of this is uh, it uh, it has a additional computation effort and uh, makes the data unnecessary voluminous and also introduce quantization errors because we are grading so and that may or not only hinder in extracting implicit three shape information but also in capturing the essential data variances for the required segmentation task so, so uh, uh, of course i mean we could do we could do this but this is uh, not the best uh, approach because i mean we are not using the original data we're transforming into grids and then we are trying to extract out the features so can we perform convolution without voxelization? So the answer, of course, is yes. And this is something uh, which we also, uh, uh, which we uh, addressed as well. And uh, here we employed like point-wise convolution uh, neural networks where the idea was pretty simple and inspired by the 2D convolution. So here what we did was basically, if this red point is a point of interest, so we defined this like this kind of neighborhood region. And like we divide this region into three cross three grids like this and then for each grid we actually take out the mean of all the features and then with this is basically represented and this gets multiplied by the kernel weight like for this for example okay, okay. so all this mean vector uh, would have, this 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 grid will have one value which would be the mean feature vector feature value of this all these points and then would be multiplied by the corresponding kernel weight vector and this all and all this and we sum this all after like like does uh, as as the convolution works and like assign that value to the uh, to this uh, to the to the to the red value, and we then we shift this to every point in the point cloud to compute out the feature of this or the activation of this um, of, of the point of, of of any of any of any, of any individual point. And we use this point and with this idea of point cloud convolution can also be extended actually to a cross convolution, where we usually have like the caps in in between. And uh, we adopted both these and and formulated an architecture which is something like this, where we had like these point clouds uh, convolutions followed by some uh, activation function here we use say activation function and we also had like so this disk connections and then we we end up in, in doing the semantic segmentation as well as the predicting the object category of, of individual objects or, or the class so this is like one of the aspects one of the uh, one of the way where you could use uh, uh, apply convolution in three dimensions directly onto the point cloud without doing the prior voxelization step and other idea, and these are the, these are the results basically on two different data sets, like quantitative qualitative results. Um, so here, this is the ground truth, all these on the left part, and these are the predictions which uh, the uh, which the is a method gave us. So which, which which seems quite reasonable. So like here also, this is another data set. We have this is a ground truth, and the prediction is almost I mean, very similar. For example, here we see there are some some are uh, some not not so perfect uh, segmentation, but nevertheless, it was uh, working quite okay. So another idea um, is is the way which which you could use to extract out features from the uh, 3D point clouds directly is the idea of graph convolution. And if you recall, uh, and how the 2D volume convolution work is basically something like this: if we have like this, say two cross say two cross C volume, 
And if you want to have like this volume involved with a what, uh, what three cross three cross C filter volume, and we want to have like this K filters, so we end up into this into this volume like which is thirty cross thirty cross K. So there's a, with stride one and no padding. So like this is so if we formulate this, so we could actually think that this this uh, images they can they're and they're actually we could also view them as a structured graph of pixels where they are basically they are connected like this. So this is a center point. So this, these are the, all the all the neighboring points of the center pixel, and they are like connected like this. And if I if I if I really formulate this uh, like uh, the way the 2D convolution works, then basically I could actually formulate it like this. So if these are these are the individual uh, uh, features of each point, and the, basically each feature point basically there would be in in a, in a, it will be C dimensions, and I could use a kernel. Kernel matrix, which is like this, which, which has a dimension of k cross c. The k is the number of filters, c is the number of channels, and I and then which which ends up giving me giving me this like to this the two D convolution result, which like which is like this like this particular weight uh, vector is multiplied by this corresponding t feature value of this of this point, and the, and we do this for all, and we just simply sum them and to have the new updated uh, feature value of this particular point. So we could we could so an effect like this, but can we? This is like this is for the structured graph. So this is this is like straightforward translation of uh, in, from structural graph to this uh, uh, to this two D convolutions. But can we do this over unstructured graph? Can we use this formulation over unstructured graph directly or not? So the answer is uh, unfortunately no. Why? Because the two things which should be preserved. Or I mean, which should hold so that it it would hold. If they, they don't hold, then this formulation doesn't hold as well. And there's that these two formulations are 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 the uh, the ordering of neighbors should not matter. So which is not the case here. And the other thing is the number of neighbors all should also not matter because we have in and when we have an unstructured graph and this point cloud is an unstructured graph. If we, if we compute a graph out of point cloud, it would be unstructured. So we won't be having fixed number of neighbors. And also, we won't because if it's, it's un unordered, so the ordering uh, would not be in, in a proper order, and it, this should not matter in this formulation. So, what could be done? So, people have come up with a formulation which they call graph formulation. So, in in that, they don't use this anymore. Instead, they kind of use this this kind of formulation, where we have like uh, summation over all the neighborhoods. So this basically resolves like all the we could have arbitrary number of neighbors of a particular point, but we simply like use this uh, summation to to make it uh, not fixed. And then uh, this this is a, this is a weight is shared around um, for all uh, for all the points uh, in the point cloud. And also uh, this this CJ, CIJ is a normalization factor which I which which will which will be clear in the next uh, couple of slides. So in this graph for uh, convolution basically how can we implement this? So if we see for from uh, if we implement, try to implement this using for loops over uh, over all the neighbors, this becomes quite expensive. So the people have actually used the vectorized computation of the graph convolution, which is like this. So people usually use this graph formulation, where uh, if we have like a, a graph uh, from the from the points out and in which the v is representing the number of nodes, e representing the number of edges, then this a hat is basically nothing but the adjacency matrix plus the identity function. And just this is this is basically just to ensure that we also include the self connection in the graph as well. And the adjacency matrix, I think, is as everybody would be knowing it, so that we this is a connection in the graph where we have a one value if the no a particular node is connected to another and a particular node. So that that we make it one. And there is this D is basically used for normalization, and this D is a degree matrix. And it is it only tells us like it, it only counts like number of outgoing and number of incoming edges of a particular of a particular uh, uh, node. And this H capital H is basically this n cross C stack node representation with because each small H calls C dimensionals. We if we have n points, we stack them n cross C stack node representation. And like this 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 whole this particular part, this actually could be pre-computed uh, per graph. Uh, well, once we once we for, uh, compute a graph, we could actually compute pre, pre compute this, and this could actually be this 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 actually relates to this normalization uh, value, and we could uh, compute this. So, so we actually use this uh, graph convolution neural network as well, and uh, in, in 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 our network. And of course, these this this W are the for normal classical C forward neural network weights, uh, 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 which which are which are useful. So. 
this is this is uh, one uh, uh, particular uh, method method in, in which we applied that. So we we have, we had like this on a uh, point cloud, and we used four uh, layer GCN network. But for in initialization, rather than to having the initial uh, uh, it, uh, randomly initialized the feature vector of each point, what we did this we computed like the point wise MLPs to so apply point wise MLPs to compute global features of all the points and initialize these DCN with those feature values instead instead of directly initializing with the random values. And this actually gave us like a, a very nice uh, results, which uh, we, um, which we if, we, if we visualize this, so you can see that like these are the uh, ground truth data and uh, these are the results which we, which we predict. So in, in qualitatively, are you you can see I mean they they look they look very very good. So this this is one uh, of the uh, another approach which where we applied this is basically uh, uh, not where where the idea is more or less similar, but uh, we did not apply directly uh, the, the graph construction was not done directly onto the point cloud, but instead we perform a series of unsupervised uh, methods where we try to first do a pre segmentation of the point cloud. And then, based on this pre-segmentated way, we, which, which, part, which we call as a geometric grouping, we, which we use this geometric grouping to create a, a, a graph out of this. So the idea is basically more inspired by the super points or super pixels in in the way. So in, in, we apply this graph on the super points, on a, each point basically now represents a, basically a cluster of points which is, which are grouped together. And when we then we feed this uh, uh, in particular work, uh, we feed this. Uh, um, Graph to basically uh, uh, to the uh, point wise MLPs to extract all the features, and this point features were then basically used in a in a, in a, in a uh, by by an LSTM to do the segmentation of each point uh, points out. So uh, this was this was also something which we 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 did. And so here, for example, this is the original point cloud. So, so the results of this this these are the geometric groupings of of these point clouds. And like these are the, then the segmentation results where we basically this, the network basically learns to basically merge all these points uh, that that share the same uh, feature values. So this was it basically for the for the segmentation. So the whole, the, the application now I would more uh, focus on the detection part, but um, and I will show you three more three, three major applications where the detection uh, actually plays vital role. And so what a detection problem is in in a detection problem, we generally tend to have uh, instead of predicting only labels, we need to have a regression ahead as well, and uh, for which 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 actually predicts the regression value. And in in the, in the, and we have a, I tend to get, merge these two regression and the classification uh, to have a, a kind of multi-task loss, which we basically use to back propagate and uh, to to extract out the class as well as the bounding box prediction. So there are actually many state-of-the-art object detection methods in Brazilian which which exist. For example, this region CNN and its and their variants and uh, like a two-stage detector and also one-stage detector methods like YOLO, uh, YOLO only look once family and there's the single shot multi detector family or a combination of single stage and two-stage in the retina net. So uh, why can't we directly use these? Uh, of course, over the over the over the remote sensing images. But the only thing is that we can't directly use the pre-trained uh, these uh, in object detection methods because, of course, uh, the remote sensing uh, images are of challenging nature because they are acquired from high altitude, causing atmospheric distortion, and they also have like different illumination and point variations, and then also includes partial occlusion and clutter. So just to show you like the comparison between the two, so this is the partial VOC data samples, and this is like a data set from the aerial imagery. So, like for example, the aeroplanes, the visual geometry of the aeroplanes, we can see from natural images perspective, they look like this, and from the image from the top view, they they look quite quite different. Like each object is quite different. For example, if you see these vehicles, so then from the top view, they are they are, of course their appearance quite changes. So, of course, we could use these uh, state of the art object detectors uh, and train them onto the remote sensing images, but the major bottleneck in this, of course, because we don't have enough uh, annotated data sets in this uh, in in our community, uh, which which could let us basically fine tune very uh, these these powerful uh, detectors. So, uh, for, by motivated by this, we also actually proposed a, a satellite images based multi vehicles data set where we had like specifically aerial vehicle data set 
and uh, like it, these are it's because the, the, these are the statistics of these data sets. If, if you compare, like these are the well-known uh, data sets in the AEL domain. So here again, Dota is always, of course, the, the highest number of instances it contains. But still, but but we have like the more uh, the major number of vehicles, uh, different type of classes, more number of classes by any other uh, by any other, any other data set. So and we also like benchmark uh, the state of the of art of the detectors onto this data set and also customize a uh, an architecture which was based on the YOLO architecture and that outperformed all these data science uh, architectures. So if, uh, if if you're interested, you can actually use this data set or see how uh, how if it is good for you or not. So this was just to give you a highlight of this, like the, of this data set, and these are these are the uh, like uh, the uh, actually gra the ground truth annotations which we perform or, or, or using this data set. So if you, if you free, if you want to use that data set, okay. So I won't I won't go into any more details into the detection part, but rather I would show three major applications of the detection and uh, which which will evolve around this uh, vehicle re-identification, image capturing, and feature point detection. So from the uh, object detection plays quite a vital role in object re-identification problem. And what a re-identification problem, for example, here we here we particularly target a vehicle re-identification problem. So here the task was to identify, identify, automatically identify and search vehicles in a multi-camera network using uh, usually having non-overlapping GW. So basically uh, we have a, a network where we have like different non-overlapping cameras and we extract out the the vehicles in a, images acquired from each camera, and then basically we try to re-establish or re-identify that particular vehicle in a different non-overlapping camera image. So the the whole scenario is like we have like these images, we do the build building with the vehicle detection stuff, and then we have like all the detected buildings from all the non-overlapping cameras. We have like the generation of gallery uh, like this, and then basically each of this feature. Uh, uh, a car basically a detected car is searched in all this gallery to find out where in which which camera it appeared at which what what instances so basically in ideal cases like if we if these are the probe images for example if we feed this image into the system this is the retrieve system should be uh, should give us like these top uh, all these cars which belong to these these this one and if we feed this one of course we uh, this this should be the retrieved one and if we feed this probe image we should we should have like these uh, as an outcome. So uh, in the, in this paper, um, uh, we actually formulated this vehicle re-identification problem into an progressive unsupervised problem, or uh, so to say, self-supervised problem. With the terminology is now more like self-supervised, and uh, we completely framed this into a self-supervised manner and achieved quite uh, quite reasonable results. So just to before telling you this, uh, I just briefly explain what a self-supervised problem is. So in a self-supervised learning problem, what we have is uh, we have lots of data unlabeled and we have a supervised model. We want to use this unlabeled data in a supervised model so that the model is able to learn good features. And uh, how can we do that? I mean, of course, there are several ways. One of the way is to, uh, by solving this using by our pretest tasks in a supervised manner and uh, labels for these pretext tasks can be generated automatically. Because we already we know the data we already have the unlabeled data itself, and we uh, we we make it like uh, we make this the formulation as such so that we don't need any external labels and we could use uh, uh, whatever the information we already have. So and uh, I'll just show you a couple of examples of what kind of pretext task exists. So uh, for example, a particular pretext task which which is which is actually relevant for us. And we we also used is something like this where we where we had like this, this uh, uh, a car image so we could actually extract out uh, this patch of the car and then uh, we could actually have like these different uh, patches or grids within uh, uh, with, of, of this particular patch and then we could actually uh, like put them into sequence like this particular patch has sequence one this has sequence two sequence three and like these all nine uh, sequences so this is one particular permutation. And, and we could actually assign this one particular per permutation and index called one. So of course we could randomly shuffle them into a predefined permutation. For example, this particular permutation maybe is a 64. Uh, we index them as a 64, and this like nine going for the first one, four being second one, and that. And we let the network to predict the index, the index of the of the of the permutation. Since we already know 
this the, the permutations we don't need i mean extra labels we, we we already know this we can extract out from this and we let the uh, uh, network learn uh, some good features out of it and we just train this and uh, network is able to identify a few important features which are relevant to a particular task for example for us it was vehicle identification and another is of course um, um, pretext task which uh, many people also use is this uh, image in painting stuff where we basically mask a region particular region in the images and then we try to reconstruct it using adversarial losses and uh, and in the meanwhile the the uh, while doing so the in the network actually learns uh, very good features pertaining to the particular particular problem at hand so we actually use this and uh, because we had a lot, a lot of unlabeled data set and we actually did some pretest tasks and and it used those pretext uh, task trained model as an initializer and in this particular case we had like this resnet 50 which we trained over pretext task and initialized that and then we had like used this uh, good uh, model to extract out the features and these extracted features we actually clustered them using an unsupervised clustering and then we had like this module which called reliable selection procedure where what where what where we incorporated some additional uh, knowledge of for example vehicle color and vehicle shape attributes to filter out the clustering results. So maybe or to to, to robustify the clustering uh, clustering individual clustering results. So these are the reliable uh, clusters, and we use these reliable clusters as and to assign the index as a pseudo label and do this iteratively uh, to to perform uh, the task. And it, it it turned out that it it it, it really works well and uh, gave us uh, some. Uh, 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 rank one accuracy of around 71 percent and rank five point eighty two percent so like these are like this is like the vehicle identification uh, results for example these are the query images also the, this is a top one match and this is a top two second second top match and so these are the top five matches and for, uh, on two different on two different data sets uh, which we paid for example here we see we have put this one and these are the five top matches which we which we get of course the problem is quite challenging but still uh, uh, at least, I mean, uh, in this formulation, we were able to uh, achieve some reasonable results. So this is like one uh, particular application of the detection. Another application of detection is this image captioning. And uh, here, by the way, I show you an example. Uh, so this, by the way, is by the way me playing with my, my with my daughter and in a week. So uh, how can how can we try to caption this image? So this is the problem at hand. So one particular way of captioning this image would we could uh, would we would could caption something like this like the person throwing a small person above right another caption could be a person looking at the blue sky another caption could be a person the small one flying in the blue sky or we could have like this person standing on the soft soft sand or like a person, this small person jumping in the cold sea. So this is this is these are different captions which we could basically generate from this. And if we focus on that, there are three essential components in this, like in the sentence uh, or the caption generation. So for, first essential component is the number is the objects which we are really interested in. So there that we there are objects and which we need to identify in the image to generate the captions. The second is is the attributes. The, the relation, the, the attribute of the of a particular object. For example, the person, the person is small, sky is blue, uh, soft, sand is soft, and T is cold. And the third is the relationships, the third essential component. And while like the relationship from one person, one object to another, another object. So these are the three uh, are the are the uh, the relationship of going, looking at, flying in in the and, and all. So uh, people have used these three essential components like this object, attributes, and relationships. To, to make a, a kind of a graph representation, a graph data structure to represent the knowledge, knowledge base. And to show you, I show you an example for this. For example, if we have like this image, so our particular caption of this image could be a man and a woman sit on a park bench along a river. So we could actually make a graph of it from it. For example, like man sits on beach, man in front of river, woman sits on beach from this, from this text itself. And like these, this this woman, these pink ones are actually the objects, and these 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 are basically the relationships of, of one object to another object. And then similarly, another caption part bench is made of gray weathered wood. So these are basically the 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 attribute of the object. So we could actually put them in between 
So bench is worn, bench wooden, bench gray, bench mirrored, and the man is bald. So the bald is also an, an, an attribute of this. We could actually represent this in all stuff like this. So people use this like for this for whatever the whatever the caption of a single image could turn up in. So to represent a complete scene graph representation, which is what it is called, to have a, a graph representation uh, like this. And uh, this kind of graph uh, representation, scene graph representation on the knowledge uh, graph is, has extensively been used in, in these image captioning problems and also in the later visual question answering uh, questions uh, problem. So there's a very um, well renowned visual genome data set, uh, which actually connects the images together with the scene graph and uh, could be used. And uh, uh, we actually uh, use this uh, visual genome data set to, to generate these kind uh, to generate uh, some image captions. So I just show you an architecture for how we did this. So uh, we use visual genome data set to, to, to basically, uh, first we have to train a deep CNN model to extract out the region or the object of interest. And the, basically this is standard object detection kind of thing. So where we detect the objects and then for this each object we have this i mean we have a feature representation and then this feature to text translation for example we use two separate lstms so for this feature to text translation is performed between two separate attributions one lstm is basically used to more focus on the region descriptions and the other is more focused on generating the attribute generation so the region description basically means this is essentially captures objects and their relationships and basically the outcome of this particular module would be man wearing helmet. And similarly, for the other attribute, this attribute generation module is basically more focused on or more like the outcome of this uh, module should be something like black helmet. So like it would, it would assign the attribute along with the object. And later then we used, we fused the outcome of these two region and attribute genera generation into a single uh, sentence generation uh, module where we uh, basically concatenate that as fit this to this the sentence generation module to to form a single detailed uh, sentence now of course this the sentence generation module is made up of an encoder decoder um, architecture with attention and where the encoder uh, model actually translates the combined region and attribute descriptions into a meaningful textual vector that is then passed to a decoder lstm to convert uh, to, to produce a single more descriptive sentence and this is actually the architecture of this particular module in, in detail. So where we have an encoder, we have decoder and the attention networks uh, working together. So now uh, we trained this particular, all this, these regions into a, uh, using the visual genome data set, like this region, uh, region de descriptions and this attribute generations. But for this sentence generation, uh, we did, uh, there was no particular data set which could be used. So we basically customized the data set for the sentence generation module using two standard data sets, MS Popo and IIT data sets, and uh, trained uh, trained that to, in order to, to generate a caption, for example, like this man wearing black helmet riding a red bike, that's something like this. So these are like the, the, the data set uh, descriptions of how we did this, but I think this is not very relevant. So I just simply, uh, maybe I just simply skip this. And so these are the, these are the kind of uh, uh, dense captions which we are able to generate. So, uh, for example, if you this is the image. So these are the two in comparison, like a famous, uh, famous image captioning uh, methods, uh, which they generate, and this like more detailed caption, which which the model our our, our method was able to uh, generate. So this like this is this is an example where the object detection really is a very vital role. So lastly, I would also like to show you another uh, example uh, in which we did not use object detection. But rather, we more focused on uh, uh, feature point detection. And here, the um, problem was that uh, we want we, we wanted to extract out features, and we used the expected features in assisting the UAV uh, localization. So, uh, of course, the problem is that we have like this pre-stored uh, very large imagery, and we have a QD imagery, and we want to find this QD imagery into this large imagery so that we could actually try to use the match region to somehow uh, lo localize uh, the, the, the UAV. So uh, just, uh, I, I think I'm running short of time maybe. So I just uh, briefly show this. So what we did this, we flew it wrong and uh, generated like three big ortho mosaics. And then uh, like these are different, on, the, on different regions. And like these are the images which we collected from the UAV imagery at three different times, so at, 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 at in the morning, at the noon, and at the at sun, at sunset. 
and sir, so one of them we fix for auto mosaic and the two other we use for the for the for the testing part and so this um, this is the architecture which we use so there we basically from auto mosaic and this um, template we extracted out features and then we use uh, extracted out a pairwise exhaustive cosine similarities to build a 4d tensor and this we, we use 4d tensor we can extract out the uh, mass matching pairs in this uh, in, the, in these modules and then basically extract uh, uh, select the top most matching uh, matching points for example if this is like the Ma one match point in the feature space in the template, one matching point in the auto mosaic. So if we basically, if I uh, visualize this, uh, if I visualize the top maybe eight, uh, so we could see something like this. So we have, for example, at this particular match point having the highest match point matching point in this. If I visualize that, that this is basically this that visualization. So these are the eight top matching visualization. So here we could see, of course, this particular region is well focused on auto mosaic in this region, so which conforms. And later we actually use the indices of these points to then feed them into the into neural network and to upsample uh, the to 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 to, to upsample the index location into the original dimensions of the orthomosaic and the and the and the template. So basically, this, these are the feature correspondences which which are generated. And uh, with basically correspondences, these correspondences are used to calculate the homography matrix using RANSAC with case of the matching of template and the orthomosaic. And uh, these are some some of the results. So we compared this with standard SIFT surf and also uh, also as well as some standard uh, deep learning based feature detectors. And uh, and and we, and we demonstrated to perform uh, I mean show the best results. And so these are some other uh, like location accuracy like in average accuracy and the error prediction. So lastly, I will before finishing, I will just show you this uh, small uh, uh, demo of this result of this work uh, which we did. So this like this is this is a NUST campus, and like this is auto mosaic of the NUST campus, and this is like the uh, images for which we use to build the correspondences using the deep learning framework, and basically try to localize this region and try to and from this localization to the center point basically gives us essentially the the uh, uh, the latitude and the longitude, so which helps us basically in system in the localization of the points of, of the of the UAB. So. The, just to summarize what I what I showed is I showed you and addressed the problem of automatic star generation annotation uh, uh, method, uh, which is always problematic in uh, in star images. I showed that you that the deep learning based point out segmentation, which is getting more and more matured, and I showed several applications uh, of segmentation and detection. Where in segmentation, I showed object reconstruction and 3D modeling and in detection, I showed three major applications of detection in, in, in like in three different applications. So finally, just before uh, summing up, I mean, uh, uh, I also did some work on like gate analysis, where we have like a person ha having a smartphone and we extracted out the initial sensor, uh, initial data, and we uh, basically segment out this individual steps from the initial data and do some time series analysis and uh, to and and extracted some soft biometrics, for example, emotions, human age, and terrain type, and also like did uh, some some work where we uh, have like pattern of one particular person and pattern of another particular person and we kind of expected step 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 we did step stepwise analysis and the train a bidirectional LSTM to then rate like to basically retrieve the patterns of a particular person like so this is basically real person re identification but using the inertia data so with this I, I conclude and thank you very much for listening patiently my, to my talk so it was I, I know it was a long talk but uh, thank you very much for your for your time and everything I'm open to questions. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you for sharing yeah. uh, your latest research work so completely. I'm sure yeah. that our colleagues still may have some questions. So we could perhaps give some uh, questions, a couple of time for a couple of questions. So please, yeah. please feel free. If you have a question, just turn your microphone on and ask. Is there not any question or comment from the audience? Yeah, maybe it was too lengthy. So we would accept. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then it's not a problem. In any case, we we thank you again.
and uh, mm, as you have consent, this this talk will be published. So for the people who was not able to join today, so thank you very much again. And then we give uh, this talk as conclude. See you next time. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Sorry, thank care. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.